There's loads of great stuff in this episode, but listen, before we get going, I would love it if you could subscribe, but as well as that, just hit the notification bell as well, because as soon as there's a new episode or something fresh from all of us, you will get it first. But for now, grab a pen and paper, because I think you might need to make some notes on this episode. It's full of brilliant takeaways. Enjoy. Here we go. Welcome to the podcast, Kelly Jones. Hi, how are you? We're well, nice to have you with us. Thanks for having me, yeah. What is high performance in your mind? Um, I guess a lot of it comes down to discipline, really. Um, when I was around about maybe 9, 10, 11, my dad took me to a boxing club and my uncle was a referee and they lied about my age um, so I could start fighting. So I was doing like five fights a season and I was training on a Monday, Wednesday and a Friday uh, and it was an old trainer, a guy called Ray and another one called Gwilym. And I can still hear those guys' voices in my head, like today, um, which is like 35 years ago, you know? So there's something instilled in me, I think, in that period of time where uh, the kind of work you put in uh, equals the kind of result you get out. Um, so to me, I guess the high performance thing is is, is the graft and the discipline, um, which is a kind of a weird thing to put into rock and roll because you're meant to be not disciplined and supposed to be very reckless so it's an internal battle that you have to have with yourself sometimes but yeah it comes down to it i think to to, to sustain sustainability anyway i think that's really fascinating observation kelly i think that um i'm a um, i'm a real advocate of the book uh the art um the war of art i yep. don't know if you've heard it where where the author in that talks about uh amateurs wait for inspiration professionals yep. just show up and do the work yeah yeah, it's the preparation. You know, you can you can walk into a situation which people can seemingly think it looks easy, but the the, the prep that you put into that position is a lot. And especially, I think in the last, I would say five or six, seven years, maybe the amount of preparation I do now before I walk out is, I would say, fifty times more than what I was doing in the nineties. You know, the nineties, I would. You know, sing an Otis Redding song backstage, have a swig of vodka and walk on stage. And that was it. That was good to and that was, there. And it was great, you know. Good night out. <laughs> but he was like, I was playing for 45 minutes, 50 yeah. minutes. I had one album and then you get two albums, then you get 11 albums and then you're playing for two and a half hours a night and the rooms are bigger and bigger and bigger and you're doing six arenas in seven days. So the recovery time is getting smaller and smaller and smaller, but the expectancy is getting larger and larger and larger and larger. So if you don't learn some tricks and preparation and tools to maintain uh, the ability, then, you know, you're going to let people down and you're going to let yourself down and all that kind of stuff. So it's about, it's always comes back to discipline, really. So what are your tricks that you've learned? Uh, a bit like Clint Eastwood said in Dirty Harry, a man needs to know his limits, really. Um, and you go through many periods in your life where you, you mess up and you're chasing your tail and I've done stuff. I've been up till five o'clock in the morning and then I had to drink water for about eight hours leading up to a show and then gone on. I've cancelled two shows in 25 years. So I've got a pretty good record of being able to still deliver. Um, but some nights, you know, you know, you've burnt the candle way too far on the other end. And, and you know, from that point, you learn how far you can go with that the next time, you know. It sounds to me like the Matthew McConaughey tip, which he gave us on this podcast of don't leave crumbs. You said, yeah. you crumbs, you've got to go back and pick them up eventually. Well, that's it. And there's nowhere in the world worse to be than on a stage singing songs that people want to sing back to you. And if you can't sing them. Uh, so I never really wanted to be in that position. So I've been in some really tricky ones, but, um, but I, I, I don't know. I've managed to crawl away from them. Yeah. So can I ask you about your dad? Because he fascinated me when I was doing the research on this, that, yeah. that he... That he grew up in the same town of Cambran. Cambran. Uh, Cambran, yeah. All right, and um, and he got out. He sort of became a did, successful yeah. recording artist himself. Yeah, and then gave it up to come back and look after the family. He did. My my dad was um. Well, like I said, my when I grew up, my old man's record was on the jukebox in the pub, which is a very strange thing, really. Um, so, what emotion did that give you? Well, I was allowed in the pub at a very young age because of my old man. I was always classed as Oscar's boy, you know. So um, I had a, like a free backstage pass to the pub and the snooker room upstairs sort of thing. So 
because the guy who owned the pub was the guy who owned the ambulance, which was my old man's uh, tour van, basically, an old ambulance. Right. So his name was Cliff Chips. And Cliff Chips was a guy who uh, used to play dominoes, but he always used to go to the Crucible and watch the snooker and stuff like that. So he was a character in himself. But my two older brothers were always babysitting for me, so they were always playing music and stuff, and they would take me around the workingmen's clubs to watch my old man sing. Um, so I'd be sitting there with my mother watching him. So I learned a lot from, from I guess, watching um, how you construct set lists and how you can walk onto a... You play working men's clubs, man. There's people with their feet up on the front of the stage reading the South Wales Echo. They couldn't care less, you know. So you had to win them over. Uh, so you could walk on and they don't care. And then bit by bit, as I watched him, he would slowly drag them in, drag them in, drag them in. And by the end, it was a standing ovation and everybody was on the chairs. And I was always like, how the f did you, how did you do that, you know? Um, so it's quite... It's quite an art in itself to to win an audience over, mm. you know, um, and that's through song selection, that's through pacing, and it's through, um, you know, knowing an audience. You know, I've always, even if you're in a house party, if somebody puts the wrong music on, you can kill a house party just in your kitchen. You know, if you don't know who's in your room and what kind of people they are, you can soon lose them and lose their attention. So I think knowing people... Working in those clubs, working in a market, once you get an understanding of human beings, I think you've got a much more better understanding of what your songs can mean to people as well. So when you're on stage, and we've both just recently watched your new documentary, Don't Let the Devil Take Another Day. Yeah. There are numerous shots in that brilliant documentary, and I'd, I'd tell anyone to go and find it and watch it. It's so interesting. Numerous shots of you getting standing ovation, standing on the stage, taking a bow. How much of when people come and watch you now performing – are you using tricks and perhaps even inspiration and lessons that you picked up from those early days? A lot, really, I suppose, back in the day. But the only thing that's different is I, I wrote all of the set list, whereas my dad was doing cover versions and stuff. So for me, um, that whole tour came as an idea during a very challenging time after having the throat surgery. Um, and I didn't realize it until this week, really, the whole concept of the tour was to pick the songs in my career that were about adversity and overcoming challenging times in my life, whether it was maybe tomorrow or into the world and all these songs that never really get played that much in stereophonic shows. So it was an opportunity to kind of sandwich them together with very uh, humorous stories about kind of traumatic, tragic events in my life. But hindsight always offers humor because at the time they're not very funny at all. Um, so you get this show of, you know, you make them laugh, you make them cry, you make them wait kind of thing. And um, so, uh, you know, going through art college, learning some stuff from there, stealing some stuff from my dad, doing some stuff myself. Did my first gig at 12 in a workingman's club myself. So um, I think that's why a lot of the big legends, whether it's the Who, Bowie, the Stones, they, they all took us under their wing because I think, I think we were kind of the last generation of bands that did do the same as them, which was in the back of a van going through pubs and clubs. Because after that, it became people getting discovered on TV and all that kind of stuff, you know. We should probably talk then about the, the throat moment, shouldn't we? And yeah. And subsequent surgery. And then, then the tour, for people that don't know, late 2018, mm. a polyp. Was it a polyp discovered on your... Polyp, Google? yeah. <clears throat> I went for a, just a regular checkup and they, they found, um, uh, they called it a, a one-off trauma polyp on my vocal cords, which could have been done by a bad cough or shouting at the football or... I was trying to trace back my steps and it was this one day I was going to the gym and I'd been trying to get to the gym like all week because, you know, a lot of kids in the house and all stuff going on. And, and I eventually got out the door and I was driving there. And as I got to the gym, I remembered I left my keys in the front door and I let out this massive. <laughs> and, I, and I always remember it kind of hurting a bit. So I don't know if that was the moment. <laughs> so the moral there is don't leave your keys in the door and all that. But um I went and had the check and they said they found this thing and then they said, go away, come back in a couple of weeks. And then I went back a couple of weeks and they're still there. And they said, come back in a couple of weeks. And then I ended up going back in on New Year's Eve for the last check. And they said, it's still there. I think we're going to have to operate. So um, they said, come back in on, I think it was January the 7th. And I went in and uh, they took it off and then I had to go to Wales for a recovery thing. I couldn't speak for about three days and then I could speak for two minutes and then I could speak for five minutes. So I was just reading like a chapter out of a book out loud and then stop talking. And so it was quite a strange uh, process. And then, and then it was about learning how to literally how to sing again. And I, I've never had a vocal coach before. So I contacted this guy who Declan, the surgeon put me in touch with 
uh, Joshua, um, and he would teach me these things about uh, blowing into straws and stuff like that first. So you you strengthen the muscle without straining it, which is quite bizarre because it looked like a bunch of uh, uh, kind of drugs. Really, with straws and bottles and pipes everywhere. So if anybody walked in my room, they probably thought I was having, on. A, having a good time in there. Um, so I just had to go through all this very, very slow process, really, and um, and try to and regain the strength in in the thing that's kind of given me my whole kind of life, really. So that to me was a very vulnerable time, as uh, as Jake said, watching the film. I was really struck by mm. the vulnerability that you that you were exposed to. But vulnerability is a common theme throughout your whole history, Kelly. So whether yeah. it's, uh, I've I, I've read the quote that you never wanted to be famous. So mm. to, to become a front man and start singing exposed you to vulnerability, and yeah. and and you know having to like lose bandmates on the journey has made you vulnerable. And releasing yeah. albums where you were told you weren't going to sell, yeah. You seem to be comfortable with that discomfort that a lot of people would shy away from. So what can you tell us, for anyone listening, mm. about how, how to be comfortable with being vulnerable? I think I've walked towards it a lot in my life, as much as I've tried to walk away from it. Um, you know, it, it's uh, when I look at the, the content in the songs, that a lot of the big songs that people uh, connect to I've come from some of the most vulnerable times in my life, really. Um, and putting that out there is vulnerable. Uh, the whole film was is a vulnerable idea to expose that this has happened. I, I, I kind of kept it secret because I needed to get a lot of these things under my belt, whether it was the albums finished, the number one record. Uh, is that why you didn't well. tell anyone? Yeah. Because it, watching it, I thought, why why not tell these people you trust and work with? You know, we've got your, your <clears throat> manager, Natalie, who came here today. Mm. She knew. But 25 years you've worked together, so yeah. I'm not surprised. But there are still people on there that you're really close with and you didn't tell them. No, the band in the film don't know. I, I still haven't told them. And it, was, it wasn't it was like, oh, let's keep this secret. It was much more about, like, if you're a ballet dancer and you broke your ankle and then you go out there and people are watching you after after a break, they're going to go, oh, it's not quite as good. You know, you see, you see it in football all the time. Somebody's had an injury. They're judging them before they've even had yeah. a crack. I needed to get to the end of something and have appreciation for whatever the job I've done neutral mm. and say, that was great. You sound better than ever or whatever. And I needed to know that myself more so. Um, and then I was just talking about it and Ben overheard it and Ben's like, you know, I think that should be part of the story of 2019. And I'm like, I'm not sure. Uh, he said, have you got footage of it? And I said, I've got all these videos. I've got millions of videos because I had to send them to the vocal coach. And he pieced it together in a way where, you know the story of the great arc from beginning middle to end which is about overcoming adversity and offering hope really which a lot of my song writing is that you know maybe tomorrow i'll find my way home there's always uh, a kind of searching for something but then offering you know there is a light at the end of the tunnel sort of thing and i i've never analyzed it but when i look back at it when i was doing the tour i noticed there was a thread and a pattern through a lot of it um and the vulnerability i think is I think when you become honest and vulnerable, I think people actually, it's a bit like if you close your heart, then, then you don't really let it out. You know what I mean? You don't let out whatever you're trying to trying to give. And I think from the late 90s when people started to have a dig at us because they praise you up and then they start giving you a dig. And then I wrote a song, Mr. Writer, about a journalist. And then they thought I was writing about every journalist. So then they all turned on me. You know, when I was walking into interviews, I was doing 12 interviews a day, every day. I mean, we were the most successful band in the country. We were headlining Glastonbury, we were headlining V, Slane Castle, all in the same year. He was, he was huge in 2002, 2003. But I was doing all these interviews, and the first question they would say to me is, so are you eight journalists? And I'd be like, so your, your back's up, and your armor comes on, and then you start showing a version of yourself, which is not the placid kind of Kelly kid that went to art college and just loved being in a band. It was a bit more like you know, are you on a pop me? And so you, you're always on your guard. So you're always kind of defending yourself. <clears throat> and you, then you kind of get a little bit, I don't know, what, are, you, you, are you on a pop? Are you trying to come at me? So it becomes a bit confusing. And then bit by bit by bit, you start peeling off. And it came to the last few years where I just felt like I wanted to show more of the personality that I know that I am in and amongst my family and my kids and, and the bandmates and everybody that I know because I've been very, very private. Um, 
And the solo tour was a v- way of doing that. I just going up there and telling stories about what's going on in my life and people liked it. And did, How much did it bother you then that people had a certain idea of what and who Kelly Jones was because of, <laughs> because of a couple of comments or a sharp tongue in the old interview or whatever? But you were young as well. But... Yeah, I was young, yeah. And it was. And I haven't really thought about it, to be honest. It bothered me in, in around about 2001, 2002. I haven't really given it much attention in my life. Ever. I'm not losing sleep over it, but around about just enough education to perform when... It was it was quite intense then. I was the first time I moved to London after breaking up with my girlfriend from back home, so it was all kind of happening at the same time. So um, it's like, um, it's a bit like a whirlwind at that point because you don't quite know who you are, what you are, what people want from you, which version of you do they like, which version of you are you supposed to be. And it was the time where the newspapers was all about slagging everybody off. We'd slag a band off, they'd slag us off. And, and it was, so it was a very... Uh, laddish kind of period of time, and to be fair, I'm not really that laddish in that way. I, I you know, I've I, I've been brought up with three brothers, but it's like we're all good drinkers and all the rest of it. But it's not really about that kind of uh, banter, really. We give as good as we get, but you start becoming a version of yourself that you that you're not really. Mm. Yeah. Well, I read about you, Kelly, that that you don't read any interviews about yourself or you, that, that you famously don't go on social media or anything like that, you shy away from it. What benefits do you think come from liberating yourself from that kind of? Um, well, when I began, I never, you know, all my mates, when they started bands, they all used to read The Enemy and The Melody Maker and all these newspapers. and But I never did, you know, uh, you know I loved, like, my brother's record collection where there's Neil Young, Bob Dylan. I, I, I loved ACDC and my dad sold records and stuff like that. So I would be, I would be taking my inspiration from music, whether it was the Kinks, Creedence, Clearwater Revival, songwriters. Uh, so when somebody offered me a record deal and I went out there, um, the process of the actual doing of it was kind of enough for me. So when it comes to the social media side of things now, I feel like the benefit really is um i never really did it for anybody else's uh opinion really i did it for my release uh, what i wanted to get from it um and i don't really need to read through you know thousands and thousands of of likes and opinions just to see what somebody else will say because as we all know in this world now nine times out of ten there could be 99 amazing comments but the one that says you know your crap is the one that you take to bed that night. So I just didn't think it was beneficial, really, for for what I needed from it. Can we talk about when you mentioned the release, writing the music? There's a lot of conversations at the moment about people talking and yeah. you know, three men sitting around a table like this having a, a conversation about your emotions as the leader of a band is not the sort of yeah. interview you'd have been having probably even five years ago, right? No, no. So let's get into what what the music does for you psychologically. Uh, it's interesting because I think in the last few years I realised that I thought writing a song about something I went through was me dealing with it, and it was done because it's quick and it's it gets out there and it's honest. I don't know where it came from. One minute it's there, and the next minute it's, you know one minute it's not there, then the next minute it's on a page. And then it kind of informs you back going, oh, was I feeling that? Right, I'm feeling that because it's come from my subconscious because I don't write lyrics like homework like a lot of people. A lot of my contemporaries, they think the lyric part is just like, oh, let's get a rhyming dictionary. I don't know, what does this, you know, that's not the way I do it. Um, if it don't come, it don't come. And I would just, if you look through my lyric books, there's not a lot of scribbling out. It just, it lands on the page and that's what it is. Um, so I thought it was like, it's a catharsis, you yeah. know, it's, so it's definitely something that comes through you. Um, but I've realized, I think, that the pace of my life over the last 25 years has been moving so fast that a lot of that stuff may have been dealt with on a very, very small uh, percentage. You've just scratched the surface, maybe. Yeah, and then as you get more time to slow down, a bit more time to reflect or other things keep coming up and the issues or whatever, they keep coming up, you realise, well, you haven't really dealt with that. There's other stuff going on under there and, you, and then you start delving into it a bit more. Um, so it, 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 it's definitely got an outlet. It's definitely got a process, a bit like a painter throwing paint or a canvas or, or you're writing a journal or whatever whatever it is, really. it's definitely It definitely has a, a purpose and a point and an honesty, but whether it's the full um, expression, the full 
outlet, the full, let's get it all out of your system. I don't know. I don't, I don't think it's the full thing, no. Do you go back and look at those things and now as an older and wiser Kelly Jones, make sure that you do deal with them? Or do you think you still haven't quite got to that point? It's fear, isn't it? Again, it comes back to the vulnerability. We're all scared of stuff. We're all terrified of being hurt. We're all, you know, whatever it's wrapped up in, you know, you can pick a, a million issues, but it all comes back to the same basis, really, which is which is fear. Um, um, and I think the older you get, the realise you can't brush it on the carpet. You have to kind of walk at it. Um, in a way, you've almost got to run towards it because otherwise it's going to eat you up, really. So, And it's horrible. Um but uh, if you don't do it, I think it just comes back around and it comes back around and it comes back around, really. So it's about peeling off the layers slowly. Um, it's a very odd job because it's a very weirdly lonely job a lot of the time because you're spending so much time when you go back to the discipline. You arrive in a town about nine in the morning, you got a sound check of four, then you probably got press between four and seven or something. And then you warm up and then you walk on stage at half eight till 11. And then you back, and then you front of fifty thousand people. Then you back on a bus, and you know you can have a good time and all that after the show. But it kind of goes round. So that all that time leading up to the show, if you're not reserving energy, by the time you walk on, you haven't got the full tank of what you need to be delivering. So it's not like you can walk around the town and have a great time in this, that, and the other. It's a, it's a weird kind of balancing act, really. And there's not three to... lead singers in the band, is there? No, it's all on you. Yeah, there's not three lead singers. Um. So there's a lot of pressure, and I, I've, I've related it. The last 10 years, I've related a lot to, to, to the sports thing. That's what I said to you earlier when I listened to the Johnny Wilkinson thing. A lot of that rang true to what I do for a living, and you're waiting for that moment where, where you actually feel it, where you feel like you're in the flow, because it's very hard to find the flow. It's very hard to become present in that thing because there's so many things going on at the same time. There's so many moving parts. So to find it, you have to completely let go and release and... You catch yourself sometimes going, where did I go? And it's amazing. And then you come back to thinking about other stuff, you know. So what does intrigue me, though, about your world, Kelly, is that the way you've just described that preparation for a show and things like that is that you must be surrounded by lots of people that just want to tell you how amazing you are <laughs> and tell you how fantastic it was and how it touches you. So when you talk about that vulnerability and feeling open enough to, to express yourself properly, how do you find or recruit people in your inner circle that you can be honest with and they can be honest with you? In the beginning, it was all mates and brothers. You know, we took everybody from the, from the village. You know, the first time the two of us pulled up outside my house, you know, it's a one-way street. It's got a bus stop at the end and this big two of us pulled up outside and my brother walked out the house, my brother Lee, and he... He looked at it and he, and he, he walked across the street and he saw there was bunk beds, he saw there was bottles of vodka in the fridge, there was beer everywhere. He said, where are you going? I said, Scandinavia. He said, fuck this, I'm getting my bag. <laughs> and he walked back across the house and he grabbed his bag and he, yeah. and he came on the trip with us. So, um, How proud were you at that moment though? Oh man, it was like the queen coming to town. Everybody was out the curtains. It was, it was ridiculous. <laughs> That's but, incredible. But it was, um, so we took as many mates as we could and it lasted for, yeah, I don't know, maybe two, three years. And then, you know, it was like a, it was like a bender, really. It was like a rugby tour, and the, and the gig just happened to get in the way of the good time. And after a while, I think it got to Live 8. And when we did Live 8, uh, we had a phone call. It was in Australia, and, and Bob Geldof was organizing the show. And we had a call saying, would you do it? And we said, yeah, uh, we got to fly back. And then we had to fly to Australia. It was a mental three days. Um, but they said each, each act is a seven-minute uh, changeover. And we thought, yeah, we can't do it. So we can't do it. And then me and Richard sat in the two of us and thought, well, we can do it. It's the crew that can't do it because they're all our mates and they're all pissed or they're all, you know, they're not prepped up. They can't do it. So that's when we realized that we've gone to one level, but the boys from back home are just still thinking we're playing in the boozer. Uh, and we were just about to turn down the biggest gig in the world because we couldn't do a seven minute changeover, which is not actually our job. Um, so then you start getting a bit more professional. You start trying to find people who, Wanna be as you know, when we toured with you two, I remember we were talking to the edge and he said, If if I want to be the best guitar player in the world, then I want my tech to be the best tech in the world. And uh and when you're touring with you two and you're touring with Bowie, you're touring with Rolling Stones, you start seeing all these different levels of people and you start seeing how comfortable the artists are on stage because all they have to do is concentrate on their job, yeah, not worrying about everybody else's job, then you start thinking, well, maybe we should take a bit of this on board really. 
And how was that though? Be because that must have been difficult that you then got the accusations that you've sold out or you've changed. Yeah, you've changed. Yeah, you be, obviously you're the bastard, isn't you? Because you you know you're letting people go, or or they'd let themselves go. You're offering them, you know, opportunities to go and learn in this kind of uh, capacity. Go to Gibson, get some training, you know, whatever it might be. Uh, but people don't often take you up on stuff like that. They just think you can carry on, but. It's just growth again. It comes back to the growth, and, and and I was honest with everybody, saying I want to keep pushing it as far as we can push it. And you know, I was very, very ambitious and driven at that point. And and whoever didn't want to jump on board, really, that was that was it. The challenge, I suppose, also is remembering the lessons that you learned from those periods. Yeah, you know, the press loved making a big thing, didn't they? When you form a bandmate, Stuart passed yeah. away. Oh, you weren't getting on. Do you have regrets now? Mm. You were getting on. You'd had yeah. a period where you weren't. Then you were. Yeah. But you still to have a childhood friend who you have to w- ask to leave the band, mm-hmm. and they pass away. You then have, you, I'm sure, thought about that a great deal. I wonder whether you've worked hard to keep hold of those lessons that you've learned, and if you have, how you've managed to do it. Because I think we all say, "Oh, that's changed my life." That and two years yeah. later, we've forgotten how. Yeah, and- it can do that. Um, the Stewart thing was interesting because again, we were very private. We knew what was going on with Stewart in his life, and we knew he was getting a bit you know, off off track really. And, you know, we've all went through it and we all picked each other up at times when we had, but Stuart was going on this on this road where it didn't look like any of us could pull him back from it. And we had to let him go. And it wasn't like getting rid of a band member. As you know, in the film, I lived six doors apart from Stuart my whole life, you know. So it's like I've been in a band room since I was 12. The first gig I did at 12, he was 15, you know. So that's how long I'd been with him. Um, so when we parted ways, you know, we didn't talk for like a year or whatever. Um, and then the press were giving me the outing about it because I'd fired Stuart because I wouldn't tell the press what Stuart was getting up to in his private life, basically, because it's, it's his business. But then, of course, when Dakota goes to number one, which is the next single after Stuart has left, the first single we ever had go to number one, which I, I wrote and produced it, the first text I get is off Stuart saying, congratulations, man, what, what a fucking great song, basically. And then the review in Q Magazine, I always remember, was... Uh, the first line said, Stuart who? So it was like they'd given me the outing, but then when the song comes out, then it's like, well, you didn't really need him anyway. And what? Yeah. So it's it's so that's why I don't get involved in it, really, because it's a bit like, well, what's the point? Because, you know, you're only taking one part of the story to the advantage that you want to, whatever cards you want to play there, you know? Yeah. It, in many ways, it, I think it symbolises what life has been like for you all the way through being in a band. It's a bit like being in an iceberg, right? Yeah. There's loads of stuff going on beneath the surface, whether it's yeah. traumas and setbacks and problems, personal or public. But all we see is the little bit of the iceberg above. And we base all our opinions mm. on what someone like you is like yeah. privately, mm. on that little bit. And there's all that underneath. And I just, I would not be able to deal with that. I just wonder how and whether you did, whether you wanted to try and tell the whole story ever. Um, it's a difficult it's a difficult thing to articulate, really, because as you're going through it, you're obviously holding on to frustrations that people are not quite seeing the full picture. You're constant. I mean, the first, the first ever time I won a Brit Award, you know, my my speech was, you know, about time for some recognition. It was the best newcomer award, and Ben Elton's like, "You've only just got you," and I'd be like, "No, I've been in my head. I'm going. I've been doing this for 13 years, mate, and it's about time somebody." But when you look back at it, you kind of go, "Well, they don't know that." Yeah, you know, so. So you're obviously craving somebody to say, you know, you're doing a good job there, mate. Um, and where that comes from, well, that's, you know, we need a kid, you wanted your own man to say something or whatever it is, you know, we've all got our reasons for it. But as you as you keep on going and people build, um, I guess, a perception through media, I always found it was more the media perception was kind of skewed compared to like when I go on the radio, people can hear who I am. Or if I go on the TV, they can, if I'm on Never Mind the Buzzcocks, they can see who I am. But when it became in print, it always came across like something else. Mm. Um, and it used to frustrate us a lot, you know, and that's why we stopped reading it all because we were like, we're not winning here. This is just, this is not coming across how we meant to be talking. Um, so you do carry a bit of resentment through it all. And then I think I've realized, I didn't realize I was doing it, but the last three years I was obviously doing stuff, making the record of Far From Saints, you know, the guys from Austin, Texas, doing the solo tour, doing the spoken word stuff. Um, 
I've clearly started to show people other elements of my talent, personality, whatever you want to call it. Even though I've been trying to do that through the brand of Stereophonics for 25 years by making every album completely different and trying to change the sound, I think I came to the realization it doesn't matter what I do and change, it'll always be under the brand of Stereophonics, you know, whether it's Coco Pops or Cornflakes, it's Kellogg's. So no matter how hard I try, this it's still an amazing job and there's 15-year-old kids come into the gigs and there's people 60 yeah. come into the gigs. It's not a bad thing to be associated... Uh, like it's an amazing... It's stereophonics. It's an amazing right. thing, but I thought I was... Tr- I thought... I was needing to walk away from it at one right. point because I couldn't work out. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not quite fulfilled. What's going on? Because I want to do stuff, and then I realised. I think in the last few years, it's more about dividing that kind of pie chart up with. Well, I can still do the stereophonics, but like the Malcolm Gladwell thing, I don't need to put you know hundred thousand hours into it now. I, it's there, yep. but I can go over there and do this other project with these guys from Texas, or I can go over here and do this other thing, and I can grow and get fulfilment from these other projects, which will only ignite. The main See, game. I think that's fascinating, Kelly, that that even through the stereophonics that you've tried different sounds. You've been yeah. prepared to like strip it back, then you've mm-hmm. done like the like the big anthemic stuff. How do you get the courage to almost let go of what might be a winning formula in one guise to try something completely different? Like what's your driver of the processes that you put in place to to reinvent yourself constantly? Yeah, I mean the first two records were, you know, of a of a typical thing, and then when we got to Just Enough Education, which became a, a really big record, it, I don't think there's many electric guitars on there at all. It completely changed it, and and then the album after that, with Maybe Tomorrow, it, it, that became, you know, there was five of us on stage, three girl backing singers. There was rugs. It almost became like you know the Grateful Dead for a bit, you know, was, and then we completely ripped that away and became three people again, and 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 come out with Dakota, which was all very linear, kind of hard edge, kind of almost like a garage stuff. So it's, to me, it's about, well, you make these small choices like, well, I'm not going to do this in this record. I'm not going to do that. I don't want to do that. I, I don't want to ever do that again. I want to try to do this. And it's about, it's about growth and trying to, you know, when I was a kid doing covers in in pubs, I wasn't just doing Beatles and Stone Roses covers. I was doing everything from, you know, uh, Bob Dylan to, you know, Bob Marley, it it didn't make any difference to me. It was always about if the song is good, it doesn't matter what genre it comes under. So I've never wanted to be boxed in with, with genre or anything like that. So they don't really feel like that big a risk to me. It's only when you put them back to back that they sound quite different from one another. It's, it's authenticity at the heart of that as well. Because like, if you look at the size and the scale at which you perform here in the UK compared to the States, right? Mm. You're not as big in the States no. as you are in the UK. You could have been bigger in the States if you'd have just forgotten about authenticity for a bit and thought, right, what do they want to hear? I don't know, I'll make a song that people yeah. love on TikTok and then that will yeah. drive my sales. Yeah. You could do that. Yeah. Is it a conscious decision not to? I've been asked for many years to do many things, you know, whether it's publishers asking me to write songs for pop artists or, you know, every year asked to go on The Voice or, or, or The X Factor or all this kind of stuff. And, and it's all great, you know, TV and opportunities and fun stuff for people. But it's like, to me, I know I wouldn't be able to believe it. Um, so these projects I'm talking about, whether it's the Far From Saints thing, that fell in my lap because I watched this girl sing in 2013 and I, I, I loved her voice and I wanted to sing with her. And I knew that if we did something together, it could be something quite unique. And to me, it's about trying to find an authenticity in, if you're going to do a collaboration, then it has to be mm. for, for, for the right reason. I'd never wanted to be a factory kind of songwriter. I could probably do that. Go to work every day and do a Ronnie Barker and write five songs a day and give them to people. But, yeah. um, but then they're not mine. They, they, I, it, it's like giving something away, you know. So what would you say you are now? Because I think you're f- you're probably finally at an age where you actually can reflect, look back, and be really honest about what you are as a as a singer songwriter. Let's mm. you know, let's talk about legacy for a bit. In fifty years, what would you want people to say about your music? Um. I think going forward, I think for me now, it's it's a bit more about a portfolio in some ways. You know, I started in art school and I was have these big folders of all different things. I would be making films, I'd be making uh, graphics, I'd be making fine art, I'd be doing all this different stuff. And and I've always done all the artwork for the records and, and the T-shirts and stage design. I get involved in all that stuff because that's what my background is. I've directed the videos and I've written the videos. And, um, you know, I've written some screenplays. I, I, I've... I've nearly got a few films off the ground. So I think going forward, it's going to be about, 
it's all going to come under the guise of storytelling. Uh, but the, the the format that falls into, I don't think I'm going to put 100% of it just into the stereophonics because when we go back to fear and vulnerability, I've been afraid of walking sideways from the stereophonics because I was afraid what would happen. And now I've actually got a belief that I, I don't have to be afraid of walking because I'm not walking away from it. I'm just taking a step to the side and doing this other bit and then, I, and then I'll be right back. Um, but I've been afraid to do that for probably 10, 15 years, you know, so allowing myself to do that, I think I've got scope to do many other things. I think bravery is such an interesting topic. Um, I just want to touch on your son very briefly, yep. who came out as trans. And again, we're not after a, some salacious headline about, you know, yep. struggles with dealing with a child who's, you know, come out as trans or whatever. I'm just, there's two things about this, really. Number one, when you talk about bravery, right, how brave you are of your son to come out in the way that he did. Like, And he goes to an all-girls school, right? Yep. To walk in their everyday yeah, taste. I, I mean, the bravery. Yeah. Is some, um, I wonder what you've learned from him. I've learned a lot from him. Um, I've learned a lot for all my kids. I mean, I've just been walking around a park with my 13-year-old because she's going through stuff as well. Um, and you you can't stop learning from him, really. Um I mean, Colby's episode was, you, you know, you you got you got a young kid telling you something's not right, and you think it's about the sexuality thing, and it and it slowly trickles into uh, the gender situation. And then I look around and I'm thinking, well, who can I talk to about this? I don't know one single person in all the people I know in my life that has ever been through this. I can talk to people about having kids from different mothers. I can talk to people about all, most things. Mm. But this is like, I've got no idea what's going on here. Um, and once I realized that was actually happening, it was a case of I have to do my research and go and talk to some therapists to get help to get him therapist because he's at an age where you're not an adult, but you're not a child and it's that in-between thing. So, But as you say, I mean, I went to watch a carol service at the school last summer and people are going, oh, it's just a phase. It'll be, you know, they'll grow out of it. And I went to this carol service and watched all these teenage girls singing with the long hair and the little spots and all the stuff they're doing. And and then he walked down with like a a short kind of cropped hair, like David Bowie or something, wearing trousers and a, and a shirt. And he's like, I look like a bartender. And he couldn't have looked more different from the rest of the girls there. And I'm thinking, well, that's, that takes a lot of balls there. Um, mm. And there's no way you would be doing that if it wasn't something for real, you know. So there's a lot of courage involved in that whole whole thing. Yeah, it's... It's incredible, really. I find that so moving because I, I, we live in a world now where being yourself is harder than ever before. Like, you, I think the three of us, you say you don't use social media. I know you don't go on Twitter because you hate it. The biggest source of stress in my life is the use of social media. Right. Now, imagine what it's like. How old is... 16 now, yeah, 16. just doing 16, yeah. And do you use this social media? Uh, I think they, they, they dip in and out of it from, from like, for an art and stuff up there, Minecraft and stuff like that, but not to the extent where it's, like... Uh, masses of comments and stuff like that just yet. No. But there will be judgment. Yeah. For course. us to deal with judgment is hard and we're all in our 40s. Yeah. Well, I couldn't believe there was no bullying at all. I, I, and, you know, when I, when I, if I compare that to where I came from, I mean, you know, uh, there wasn't any black people in where I grew up. There was, there was, there was, a, there was two gay people and, you know, um, and literally, this no joking aside, they literally worked in the hairdressers. You know, it's that old cliche. So it's like where I came from, there was everybody had buried prejudices they didn't even know they had. Mm. So when these things become brought to life, you don't really realize what your uh, omnipresent beliefs are, really. And then you you have to face them, as I said earlier, by walking into them. You have to kind of go right. Well, it's it's courage, man. Um, and at the end of the day, it's not me waking up every day feeling like that. It's it's Colby. Um, all I am is a support network, really, and I have to just kind of guide him through it, you know. We have a lot of parents that listen to this podcast, yeah. and a lot of our guests talk about things they've learned in their careers that they can apply as parents. What have you learned from that episode that's made you a better parent, do you think, that our listeners can pick up from? As a better parent? Um, I think, you know, I've got four kids and each one of them have got their own story really uh, from 16 to six months. And there's a lot of um, 
information you can keep giving them and there's a lot of information they can keep giving you and they can get all the statistics they want off YouTube and all the rest of it and you can try to reason them and all this but at the end of the day I think ultimately all a kid wants to know is that they're safe and if you give them a hug and just tell them look it's going to be all right man and uh, it might take a bit of time but that's that's it because I think if you talk to them too much I tried it this morning it didn't work but the hug worked a hug always works doesn't it hug always works yeah. Can we talk about hard work? Yeah. I think it's another area that people don't explore often enough or don't talk about often enough. How hard do you work? And you can be, <clears throat> you don't have to be modest here. Like we need, we need the truth about this. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've been called a workaholic. I've been called many things. <laughs> uh, how hard do I work? I go, I suppose I push myself quite hard. Yeah. Um, but the problem is I don't feel like I am pushing myself that hard until my body starts going a bit crazy. I mean, in the last few months, I've had quite a lot of weird nervous system things happening to me, probably because my body has stopped after 20 odd years of going and going and going. And um, just kind of coming, I think my body was actually coming down to land basically and didn't know what was going on. Um, but I do push myself quite hard in the sense of, I think that comes back to the fear thing again is because I've been afraid of letting it go. So I'll come off tour and say I'm not going to do anything. Within six weeks, I'm probably back in the studio with a bunch of songs and calling everybody up going, I think we need to do this. And it, and it goes very quick again. Um, I think I work very hard as a father. I think I work very hard as... I'm kind of a, a bit like a loaf of bread that's constantly being poked by all sides, really, in my house because when I walk through the door, I feel like... This lion has returned from the jungle and they all want to ask me something or do something and I I can't not give them my, all my time. Yep. Um, and I don't know what that is and it, it's become to a detriment of my own health and self to a point because I haven't really learned how to delegate that very well. I haven't really learned how to ask for a lot of help a lot in my life and I'm not one having nannies running around the house or anything like that. I've always done it all. And, and, and Jackie, obviously. Um, so I work really hard. I guess is the true answer to it. Yeah, I do. Could you have achieved what you have without that hard work? <clears throat> no, I think tenacity and hard work, I think that comes from the working class background. But I think there's something I'm learning now is there's a lot more to life about being as well as the working thing. And I think I've been working and going and going and going. My Both grandfathers were miners. My dad and my mother were factory workers. My dad would go into slinging the clubs in the night. Uh, everybody I looked around at was always grafting. If I came home from school and I was lying on the couch and my old man walked through the door at 4.45, my mother put the dinner on the table, I'd feel the need to get up off the couch and sit up. He never told me to get up and sit up, but there was a feeling I had that you better get up because he's been at work all day. Yep. And I guess that's been instilled in me really. You know, you, it's, it's about, I don't think you'd sustain in any industry without putting the preparation and the work in. It just doesn't last. I've looked around me and most of the people who have started with us are not there anymore. Um, and and it, it does come down to craft and it comes down to determination and ultimately hard work. So some of um, your career is spent with like Tom Jones. Mm. You toured with Bowie uh, in the early 2000s, Kelly. What advice did they pass on to you, like that generation above? about hard work and graft and learning your craft that, that you uh, can share with our listeners. I remember sat, I remember we did the tour with you two and I remember Bono sitting on a table with me once and he said, if you look around a table um, at some point in your life and more than, uh, more than 70% or something uh, on your payroll, then you probably become a prick. <laughs> so... Every dinner I ever went on from that point on, I'd be like... <laughs> Counting the people. Yeah, I... Life advice from Bono. That's a whole different <laughs> podcast, isn't it? Um, uh, David Bowie, I, I guess, for what I learned from him was... Uh, I mean, watching that guy touring from one end of America to the other and craft, we talk about set list, the way he played the set list in the middle of America compared to how he played it on the West Coast and the East Coast was completely different. Uh, in the middle, it was all very... Um, you know, let's dance and do what he needed to do. But then he became more left field everywhere he went. And he was really? about knowing the audience. It was very interesting to see that. Um, 
Would you talk to him about that? Or do you think it was all yeah. Messed up? Right. And what did he say? He just knew his audience, really. And, you know, he was, a, he was an, you know, I would write screenplays and I would give them to him and he would critique them and give me notes. He, he was huh. like, he was, um, because it was the reality to I don't think he was playing any character. He was just being himself and he would come and sit on an icebox in the dressing room and just talk to you and ask you about your family and stuff like that. He was, he was very grounded at that time. Um, like we had a five-side football match and he was on the side of the pitch and heckling us. And when we lost, he brought the trophy down above our head on a piece of string and told the audience how crap we were at football. I read a great story about him. Did he ever tell you about his, his and I'm going to, I don't know if I can edit this out, where um, when he was doing his uh, Ashes to Ashes and he, he was on Brighton Beach dressed as a yeah, clown. Video, yeah, yeah. And he talks about the story of uh, a guy walked in shot and somebody said, do you not know who that is? And the bloke walking his dog has said, yeah, it's some in a clown suit <laughs> and apparently <laughs> he would sort of remind himself of that phrase that was a phrase yeah. he would use to keep himself grounded and yeah. that's worth he it he was grounded he was funny man he was um, but yeah I mean what a privilege to, to have done that he was um, <clears throat> obviously a legend so um, I guess Tom Jones was about what I learned from Tom is that how much he kind of loves life really Um you know, you'd land, you could be, you could be in Sweden or somewhere, Stockholm, landing 11 o'clock the night, everything's closed and stuff would open up for him. And he'd always have, he'd always have a good dinner. He'd always, he'd always do the things that you should be doing in your life because he was always that relaxed. Um, he didn't really have an artistic brain in the sense of overthinking anything. He's much more like, this is what I do. And that's, and you know, and then I'll go out my dinner. And it was, it was much more, um, Old school. Have you got to that point yet? No. Are you keen to get there? I'm not sure as a I'm not sure as a writer I'd ever get there. I think because Tom has always his voice is his is his thing and his personality, and because he was taking catalog from other people, he never had to go away and he didn't have to go mining for the goods, sort of thing. You know, when I go to work every day, there's nothing there. And I've got to come out of there with something, you know, it's not like your friends working in the bank, but they still deal with other people's money. I've got to go and find my money, you know, yeah. almost make it. It's, um, it's a kind of weird headspace, you know. But you're somebody that, that, that seems to be incredibly open to experiences, whether this was like you say, when you started on the fruit and veg stall or yeah. when you were a kid growing up and you were observing your father on stage and that you are a storyteller by nature. I love that definition. Mm. So, how have you taken these stories of characters like Bowie, like Bono, like Tom Jones, and assimilated it into your own life? What is the one or two lessons you've taken that you have processed and that you still use? Um, the, f the first time I ever met Tom was in a pub, and I remember sitting down with him, and he he sat me and Stuart down for about three and a half hours, and every single name we threw at him, from Morecambe and Wise to Frank Sinatra, he had an anecdote for. <laughs> and... I came away from that thinking he could have had maybe two minutes with each one of those people. Uh, he could have had two weeks with each one of those people. It doesn't really matter. He had an experience with everybody, Elvis, Muhammad Ali, and he would tell me jokes about all these different people. So as you go through life, you realize, God, all these people you meet, you, you've got a tiny element of a story of all these people, and you can carry that and, and use that to, uh, you know, whether you're on a dinner table or whatever it might be. And, I think these people, whether it's Roger Daltrey or when I did the teenage cancer stuff, I did that for 20 years. You meet all sorts of different people in this industry. And, and at the end of the day, you're learning something from everybody. You know, that's one thing my old man told me when I was a kid. You can always learn from somebody and you can always learn from somebody what not to do as well. Mm. It's, it, it's the two things. It's not always about stealing something. It's like, well, I wouldn't do that. You know, it, yeah. it, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of things you can take. It's about being present, isn't it? It feels like Tom Jones is the kind of guy who is present. Yes. So when yes. he's with you, you get yes. all of him. Yes. He's not thinking about tomorrow or sending a text no. message or he's there. So you yes. can ha that, that's when you get those moments together. That's absolutely what it is, yeah. And I think, well, I think most people are guilty of that. It's very, very few people yeah. you find who are able to do You have that. to work hard. You do have to work harder, yeah. Isn't. Yeah. But I don't think he does. I think he is naturally in that place, you know. I Are think. you naturally in that place? No, I'm not. No. You, it's a really good. I mean, John Wilkinson on the podcast you listened to, as mm. we spoke about, all of me in every moment. Yeah, was his phrase, which I think yeah. is like I've used that so often in my yeah. own head. I think I've lost years. Do you? Yeah, 
absolutely. Yeah. I've lost years worrying and not being present in the room. And um, my head has took me down so many wormholes in my life that I've lost so much time from doing it. And that's one thing I, I in the future, I'd never want to continue to do. It's just a, it's an occupational hazard in some ways because the places you go to brings out some gold sometimes. But unfortunately, yeah, you can miss moments in your life that are right in front of you. I wonder whether you have to go there, though, to do what you've done. Like, a lot of worry, like I always, my wife worries a lot, and I always say to her, it's your brain playing a trick. Yeah. But in some ways, you have to let your brain play tricks on you and do some crazy stuff, because that's where you're... Yeah, a little bit of magic. Just you yeah. know, and it is. It's then, is it going to be the worry trick, or is it going to be the magic trick? You only find out when you open the door, right? It's true. And you know, if I've gone to see people about it over the years, you know, it's like, well, if, you know, I'm never going to be a guy that's going to take medication to level off whatever I'm feeling, this, that, and the other, because you know, what I do is what it, that's what it is. It's the mm. it's that kind of thing. But but you're absolutely right. It's going forward. It doesn't mean you can't get gold from being present either. You know, because you're seeing more. Um, yeah. so it's a new, it's a new episode for me for, for sure. And, and I'm making new boundaries in my life and trying to do new things and different things because I think, I think it's standing up to the fear really and the, and the vulnerability of it all and trying to make it like, well, you know, challenge it <laughs> in, in a different way. Brilliant. It's been so nice to sit and, and chat for the last hour. Um, uh, therapy, are you an advocate? Uh, I am. Yeah. I've used it on and off in my life. Um, I've had a lot of stuff going on in my life at different times. And, and like I said, I'm, I'm using it now as well with what Colby's going through. So I think it works for different people. Some people don't get off on it, but I, I think if it can help you through certain times, then yeah, some people can't talk and some people find it better writing stuff down or whatever, you know, but um, I feel it's worked for me because I, I think I can articulate and express stuff and get something back from it. But yeah, and it doesn't have to be a formal fifty quid an hour therapy. Sometimes just a conversation like this. Exactly. I mean, approach to life. Yeah, I mean, every other week I'm rehearsals with the boys is like a therapy session. Every time I walk in the studio, it's a therapy session with somebody. Somebody's having some drama. It goes on forever. Good man. Listen, thanks so much for sitting down and chatting with us. Um, the the film "Don't Let the Devil Take Another Day" is for anyone that wants to find out even more about you. It's well worth well worth watching. It's an amazingly uh, moving film. Totally honest, and you know, I think that. When we sit here and have a conversation, whether it's those early days when you set the band up and you got rejection after rejection after yeah. rejection, or when you had five number one albums on the spin, then you released an album that went to number 11 in the charts. And I know at the time the label went, oh, well, you're done now. You can just write songs for other people. Or, That's right, yeah. You know, <clears throat> losing a bandmate or um, your son coming out as as trans. There's, there's always things that you've had to deal with over the years. And I think at times we can get obsessed with the fact that this is something that I can't cope with. And it's only on reflection that you realize all the brilliant stuff that's happened to you is because of those moments. It is. I mean, I mean, 2019 was unbelievable, man. It was, it was Colby telling me he wanted to be a boy. I had uh, throat surgery. We had, um, I was just about to play Latitude. Jackie had a miscarriage with twins. It was, it was so much going on in, in, in one period of time, all happening. And it's not until you watch that film back, you actually realize you know what was going on behind the eyes really yeah uh, it's quite it's quite alarming what what people can go through you know um yeah. but yeah it is it is those things that get you out the other side like i said i probably wouldn't be talking the way i'm talking if i hadn't gone through it unfortunately you have to go through it didn't you sure but yeah. but as a viewer kelly i'd say that you that i came out with an enhanced level of respect for you that not thank only you. were you a survivor but you kept yeah. your dignity as well so thank you for sharing it thank you very much man appreciate that Interesting episode, hey? And of course, there's so much more from the High Performance Podcast as well. Please hit subscribe, hit the notification bell, give us a thumbs up, leave a review, but somehow get involved with the High Performance Podcast and become part of our growing community. Thanks for being part of the adventure. <laughs>